other, other folks have already dropped a, the shit bomb, and so I don't have to be the first one. I was nervous that the, there might be kids in the audience or something. But, so um, uh, this, uh, I got into human waste management not on purpose. Uh, I, as I've told uh, some of you, I'm a failed mountain guide. I had the president of the Association of Canadian Mountain Guides on a short rope um, on, on a big glaciated peak in the Canadian Rockies, and, um, and, and we're going along, and it's pretty steep, and you know, my crampon literally falls off in the middle of the face. Um, and you know, I look down at him, and you know, I, my cheeks are already pretty red, but you know, I'm beat red, and he just goes like this. Um, so that was the end of my mountain guiding career. And uh, I went to a bunch of park operators, um, having gotten some money to do my PhD research, and I asked the park operators, what should I do, my PhD on, that it's useful and doesn't sit on a shelf? Because I still wanted to work and serve the alpine environment. And every one of them said instantly, human waste. Look at human waste. Shit in the woods, shit in the mountains, um, shit in the desert, shit on the river. Everyone, every park operator, same thing. Um, so I didn't pick the project, it picked me. Uh, and so I just applied academic rigor to shit in the woods, shit on the mountain, shit in the rivers. And started at the very beginning because there was very little research, very little academic peer-reviewed um, research on management of human waste in remote sites, waterless human waste management. So right to the very beginning, um, I just said, what, are, what should the objectives be? What are the baseline? What data do I need to collect um, to evaluate shit in the woods, shit in the mountains, whatever? Um, so, you know, I went to the very beginning. How much does it cost per use? How much human waste per use? What is human waste? What is it made up of? Um, and then applied, you know, simple investigative inquiry. How else is this managed? And under what objectives, what prioritization of deliverables do we manage this in other areas? And do natural ecosystems manage shit in the woods, shit in the mountains? Humans have not been here for that long um, compared to the rest of mammals and to the rest of organisms before mammals. And everything makes shit. But it seems like humans have considerable problems with their shit. So here we go. Um, <laughs> Waterless toilet overview. Here's a comparison. I'm going to get right to the like, right to the goods of it. Um, and, and I'm glad we had the presentation from Sandy Sphere. Um, they, did they leave? Terrible. I hope they come back. Um, so on the right is a, is one of their toilets. It used to be called EcoSphere when I was there doing research in 2012. So um, this is in a, a highway. It's highway right beside. The highway, little, they like traffic circles. They're so much better than stop signs. They're so much more fuel efficient. But anyway, um, big city over here, big city over here, rest stop. There's a restaurant right here, which is how I could pinpoint it um, to this exact place. And um, I compared that, in essence, my PhD, part of my PhD, compared European urine diverting vermi composting toilets to North American um, composting toilets. So here's that facility. Um, it's in Faverge, France, roadside, open 12 months a year. The use was estimated about 20,000. Here is a composting toilet beside a lake um, with a campground in Alberta. It's called Elbow Lake. Um, this road is open three months a year. And it's about an hour, hour and a half drive from Calgary um, off the Trans-Canada Highway. Uh, estimated at 5,000 uses per year, which is probably high. Two stalls. There's one door. There's the other, male, female. Okay, two composting toilet chambers in there. Annual operation maintenance cost. These are numbers that came directly from the park operator. Um, $2,660. Uh, weekly operations and maintenance. Cost per use is about 53 cents a use. Um, occupational health and safety exposures were estimated at about 33. Weekly, for the time period the guy is going in there, and shoveling, you read the instruction manual on these things. You've got to shovel and rake and pull, pull plastic out of the composting. You need to go and mix it all up. There's things you do to make it compost. Okay. So, and then every year, you have to pull all the material out and send it to the dump, because they realized pretty quickly that they were pulling out things that looked like fecal deposits and didn't make sense to dump those into the park right behind the toilet, which is 
about six inches above the water level, which is about 20, 30 feet from the lake. The other site, annual cost, I estimated the actual cost at about 700 American dollars. Um, back at this point in time, 2012, Ecosphere was offering service packages for 500 euros. And they would offer those for however many years, the, the, whatever facility wanted. And that was 500 no matter where it was. And as you said, you heard them there, they 10 minutes per, I think it's more like an hour. In re reality, you gotta move a big pile of stuff around. But they would drive the truck you know, to 10 or 20 toilets a day um, during their two week annual maintenance tour and they would service all of the solid waste in all of their toilets in Europe over the period of about a month. Um, and offer that service, making money, you would imagine, at about 500 euros a year. So translated and taken some profit out of it, it's about 700 bucks. Uh, yearly maintenance, as she said, with a cost of about three and a half cents per use. Um, considerably different there. Uh, three exposure events per year, and I calculated 20 minutes with less than three feet separation between the eyes of an operator and a pile of shit to be one. Um, uh, exposure event, so this is about an hour's worth of exposure to fecal matter per year. And material removal estimated at every 10 to 20 years. Um, I don't have any better information on this. When I did the research in 2012, they had 200 toilets installed at that point and had never taken material out. Um, we can ask questions to see if any of their toilets have been emptied of material subsequently. But these are toilets that have been installed since 2000 um, and by the time I got there in 2012, some of them were 10 years old, never been emptied. Um, some of the ones that are high use, five or seven years old. Um, perhaps you saw the chamber that they're, you know, the space isn't very large. Um, six, eight, 12 inches deep at the most. Okay, so that, that's in essence, that's like a snapshot of what my research was. So I'm gonna step back um, and go through some of the steps that led up to that. Um, okay, so here's the outline. What's the waste? What waste paradigm? What, what paradigm are we operating under when we, as a, as a body, um, install a toilet system? There's been a, a waste, a paradigm through which that technology or that principle or that concept from a CMC mountain can to a, a composting toilet. There's a paradigm that's infiltrated and underlies the decisions and the design and the management. So we're gonna spend a fair bit of time talking about that because ultimately it's the paradigm that drives how we end up on the ground managing waste and what the impacts are. What is compost? Because there's a lot of erroneous information out there. Um, true challenges at remote sites, types, objectives, and evaluation of remote toilets. This is some guts of my PhD research. Human waste composition and production. When we start wondering why isn't this working right, it drives us to go back and look at what are we dealing with? Um, what is human waste? The benefits of source separation, as you may have gathered, um, which is largely accomplished through urine diversion, and uh, comparative, you, you saw the, the one screen snapshot of comparing these two systems, it's dramatic. We're not talking about a 10%, 15%, we're talking 10 times to 100 times to 1,000 times better performance in terms of cost, um, pathogen destruction, exposure events. It's, it's rare to come across something like this in an engineering or technical field. Lots of the time you compare technologies and you're looking at five or 10% difference with about the same efficiency versus cost comparisons. Here we're in a whole other league. So it's kind of cool, it's fun. Um, oh, I don't know the space bar. Okay, at the very beginning, flush toilets. We have flush toilets here. Um, we, we all probably, most of us live at home with a flush toilet. I was up in Glacier Bay and I met these two great people, Rusty and Janine. I mean, they lived, they built their house in the 60s, still live there today, and in 2006 put in water. Um, so th there are some people still that live a rudimentary lifestyle, but generally we have, we have flush water at home. Um, water's cheap, pretty much limitless in the Western world. We, we're never, well, there's some restrictions, I guess, in the San Francisco areas, so regardless, Cheap power is limitless, basically, and cheap. We have on-site labor. Most of us spend, um, unless we travel a whole bunch, half a day at home, you know, 12 hours at home. And we have nutrient needs. We have a garden, probably, and we all, most of us have lawns. We still flush our excrement down the toilet. Um, and if any one of you were thinking about 
turning your human waste in, into compost, you'd probably shy away from it. And who has a composting toilet at home? You do, really? That's awesome. Okay, I'd love to chat with you guys about it afterwards. Did you choose purposely to put it in? Neat. Um, so that's great. There are some people motivated to use the nutrients that they're producing you know, in a waste product at home back in. But most of us use the toilet and our culture has moved towards flush toilets because it's a very efficient, incredibly safe waste management utility. Um, and some people refer to it as the number one invention in human health because it had such a dramatic improvement in reduction of disease um, through the Western world. Water, ultimately, though, there obviously, is, it's not terribly sustainable. It doesn't feel good to flush our waste down with water. So I'm not saying this is the be-all, end-all, and we should go and install waterless toilet or water toilets in the backcountry. And ultimately, everything at the wastewater treatment plant, we take all that crap out of the water. You take all the solids out. You try and take all the nutrients out if you're going for a, you know, level two or level three water treatment plant. And then other people take the water and flush down it again. So ultimately, I don't think it's great. Um, but it shows that if you approach it with a waste management mentality, you come up with something very different from if you were approaching it from a, a nutrient recovery. So um, a few other things here coming on from this. At the wastewater treatment plant, every wastewater treatment plant produces biosolids, um, which are semi-processed human um, excrement, waste, human waste, and um, some other industrial wastes. Uh, combined together with some water and then it's extracted again with some sort of mechanisms. So biosolids in the USA. Um, the majority of biosolids are incinerated or land applied. Um, there's smaller amounts that are composted. And there are very strict regulations for how they are composted and the regulatory um, uh, constraints are um, challenging. You know, they're challenging for municipal operators, they're challenged for public operators, and it's expensive. It's, uh, uh, to process this through, there's EPA rules, it's called 503, it's a thermophilic engineered process where you need a certain scale um, and you need the uh, rapid escalation of heat that builds up and cannot dissipate fast enough so the temperature of the pile increases. But while it's increasing, it's consuming moisture and oxygen, and unless you take very good care of it, it gets out of control and smells bad or stops. Um, so a lot of mechanical equipment, some mixing, you need to adjust moisture, you need to adjust bulking agent for porosity um, and free air space. Um, and you need to do um, uh, consistent quality control measures, so you're measuring temperature throughout the process, um, and then at the end, you go through a very extensive laboratory analysis to prove that the uh, fecal coliforms confirmed that this long temperature intensive process was met. Um, I ran a very large facility in um, Richmond, British Columbia. We did 200,000 tons a year um, for the past year, and uh, that's about 100 dump trucks a day of green waste. Um, so I have intimate um, understanding of how difficult it is to do, period, and then to do profitably. So composting is tough. And eventually, you, you do end up with a useful soil amendment product that's stable and mature and has low metals and low pathogens. So that's, that's what would be necessary for a public institution to manage human waste, fecal matter, at remote sites. They would need to do the same thing through the same process, through the same regulations, um, because they're a public operator managing human waste and trying to make compost out of it. So. Um, here we have a remote site. This in particular, this is a Mount Rainier uh, pan point. And it's so, it's funny. I, every time I think about it, I laugh. Um, it's almost like last, uh, last conference, Gary Oy, is that right? Was talking about this uh, composting toilet building um, that he burned down um, on purpose because it was such an atrocity. Had been built as a composting toilet and modified with panels and solar panels and PV panels and hot water panels and a drying rack. And um, he, I think he just couldn't stand the next thing that was going to get proposed to him to fix this thing, so he burnt it down. Um, this is rock, so no one will ever burn this down. Um, but we have no power, except if you put in solar panels, and we know that they get stolen. Um, we have no running water, except for snow water. You're going to somehow melt and collect in the tank. Yep, they're doing that. Um, limited and expensive labor. They have Dr. Rich Lichnitter managing this facility. He has a PhD in biology from UBC, and he mostly shovels shit. It's very cold, 
and there's absolutely no use for nutrients. Um, this is Mount Rainier. We're not growing anything specifically there. We don't need to fertilize, and the plants there do fine without human shit or piss. So we're trying to compost. This is a composting toilet. There's a composting toilet blasted and placed into a hole in the rock under this building. You have to access it by like, going down this very small ladder, and there's all of this stuff all in the way, pipes and hoses and pumps and all sorts of ridiculous equipment, to get into the bottom and to empty it out. Rich goes down with a small bin and puts it underneath and shovels it out and somehow gets up the ladder again, gets it out the door, gets it into a 55-gallon bale, pail, and they fly the pail. He puts it in a truck, drives the truck down to the wastewater treatment plant, and gets it into the manhole in front of the wastewater treatment plant. <laughs> Incredible. F 50 cents a use, it's a lot more than 50 cents a use here. Okay. So, um, those are the challenges of remote sites. Types of toilets are remote sites. We already gone over some of this. John did a great job, um, and other people too. We got a pit toilet, and technically speaking, um, there's discrepancy in some of the language, but I'm gonna call a pit toilet here where you dig a hole in the ground, you crib it up with some wood to make sure the hole doesn't fall in on itself, and then people pee and poo into it. Often, the bigger, the longer you keep it for, so you dig a bigger hole, um, so you don't have to dig another one as quick. You fill it up, you cap it, and you dig another. Um, <laughs> uh, composting toilets, you buy the unit. Uh, users add sawdust or wood chips or something, bulking agent thing to it. You service it weekly if you're following the instruction manual, which involves shoveling sh garbage out because you're making compost and you wouldn't want garbage in your compost. Um, you know, black water leaches through it because you're peeing and pooing in the same hole, and if you don't have enough bulking agent, then the urine filters through the rest of it, goes out the bottom. You dump the solids on site yearly if you've kind of closed your eyes enough to the fact that you read the instruction book and it said you can dump it on site. Or you pack it out if you're in the National Park Service because you're following the regulations. Um, and then a vault is a... Uh, total containment vessel that's either pumped out with a pumper truck or flown out in some various capacity. So um, that Romtech um, that we saw, the new Orca, Norca, um, or just a barrel or anything else. All sorts of things have been developed. Uh, you remove it to a wastewater treatment plant and they suck it up. Incinerating, there's very few of these. Evaporating, uh, uh, the same thing. There's not that many that I've seen. Um, sometimes there's evaporating components on a vault, but I think that's just a sales pitch. Um, and then it, urine diverting vermicomposting toilet. There's a few other types of toilets, but those are the main ones. And in reality, pits, composting, and vault um, are the ones that are used in North America. In my PhD, I covered toilets, public um, operations with toilets. And pack out and cat holes and decentralized systems are excellent alternatives in certain situations. When you get an accumulation of people in a place, even if um, it's a campground that's sort of dispersed, you're gonna find waste, and I think it's appropriate to put a toilet in, in most cases where there's even more than low use. So that's, that was my focus. Now let's look at the objectives of these toilets. And please, throw your hand up and like debate lively with me while this is going on. A pit toilet, it seems like that's purely cost. Let's come up with the simplest system that costs us the least, with a largely complete disregard of environmental impact. Dig a hole in the ground, poop in it, you've just created a dump, essentially. It's a small dump, and you move the toilet structure over top of it. To me, it's no different than a dump, because all sorts of other stuff's going in there. You may think that it's actually getting treated. Um, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years later, I've talked with operators who go and dig again in another hole, and there is a pit filled with human waste. And it looks the same, smells the same, is an old dump, just like if you dig down into a dump today, you will find cans and newspapers. You can open them up and read them. Um, human waste does not degrade in a hole when it's pee and poo together. It's inhibited pee and poo for a long, long time. Unless there's some seepage or, or like groundwater subsurface flow, and then now you've just peed and pooed in your groundwater. Good one. Um, and actually, we'll get to that. <laughs> yeah. So c composting toilets, I mean, I think the objective of a composting toilet is to make compost. And when I read the instruction manuals, that's what I come across with. Does anybody have a different opinion? What do you think? I, I think the, the idea for us kind of is just to keep it, um, well, compost it so that it breaks down and doesn't take up space rather than actually making compost to be used as compost. So it's more of just like a space saving. 
does it actually space, does it save space, do you think? Okay, okay. So um, I think one of the underlying tangents that might get thrown in is that there's a mass reduction. And accompanying composting, there is a mass reduction, generally. But um, I, I think there's an overwhelming consensus that a composting toilet strives to make compost, thus the name. Uh, we'll get to that, too. Um, so from what I've heard of different public operators running composting toilets, there's a large, largely, large disregard for the operation and maintenance cost. It seems like this desire to make compost has superseded that the, the base case, which we're a public utility, we should be conserving resources, one of which is human labor and the capital or the operating costs for these facilities. And um, so primary objective in a composting toilet, I think, is to make compost, and there's very little regard for how much it's costing the park to do that. A vault is an operate, it's a waste management facility. A vault is like, let's collect it, and let's do our best job collecting it. Low environmental impact, let's get it out to a wastewater treatment plant, which is a public, well-designed facility to manage human waste. Um, and I think those are really effective at doing that. One of, some of the challenges are sealing between the vault and the concrete slab that's put on top, and that there's a, there's a leachate to the environment pathway there. But in general, they're designed from a waste management perspective. Let's cost effectively, contain this in a big a container as we can, and as low frequency as possible, come and pump it out. Usually the pump out ends up being every year because uh, they end up smelling so bad because of um, the urine, mostly. Now, the, when, I, when I went over to France, um, and I, I spent some time with Pierre um, Colombo, uh, some English, some French, I'm, I speak poor French and he speaks poor English, or at least pretended to, so that he didn't have to while I was there. And he could not fathom, could not get his head around the fact that composting toilets in North America tried to make compost out of shit, human shit, in the backcountry. Couldn't, he did not believe me. No matter how many photos I showed him, and showed him instruction manuals, couldn't believe it. Literally just n never wrapped his head around it. Because it makes no sense. In his perspective, a public utility is managing waste, and why don't we do it the same as a wastewater treatment plant, a sewer system, the flush toilet? Um, let's design a system that has the lowest operating cost, that reduces, that actually reduces the end volume waste, end mass waste, and manages it to an acceptable environmental standard. Much our wastewater treatment plants um, inject uh, water back into rivers. Um, it, you could have this perception that that's not safe. We're taking water that's gone and mixed with human waste and putting it back in the river. But there's a lot of research that's gone to show that you can treat waste and water appropriately enough to put the water back in the stream. So there's acceptable environmental impacts to most of what we do, and that's how we manage ourselves in our, in our environments, be it urban or wilderness. And at the same time, let's have a very high regard, you know, equal or exceed our local regulations and norms for human health and safety. That's how the urine diverting vermicomposting toilet came up and what I think the objective is. You can see my slant on what I think, <laughs> obviously. For North Americans should apply. Okay, let's get, let's get deeper. Let's, let's get face to face with this. Pit toilets, um, often cases, are dug into groundwater or they're dug in the summer when, when the groundwater's lower because that's when you can get your machine in there and dig. And then in the winter, the groundwater comes up. And here's a toilet in a World Heritage Site. Um, I won't try and name too many of these places. Um, it's, this, is, this is a lake. This is a small lake that's inside the toilet. You, you can see it's shiny. There's every, everything's floating inside the lake that's the toilet. That's a pit toilet. This is very, very common in British Columbia, that we dig pit toilets into groundwater. Um, Washington doesn't allow pit toilets anymore, and they say the bottom of the pit toilet has to be three feet above seasonal high groundwater. But very few operators are going in and digging these things up anyway um, to look before they go in there. And he, this is the funniest thing about this. So I went in here to uh, do some other research, and I found that I couldn't because it was a lake. This is a stream. There's the toilet that's this. Drinking water, no washing within 30 meters of the stream. But take a shit in the groundwater right over there. <laughs> Good one. Use only biodegradable soaps. Who cares about the soap? You're shitting in the groundwater. And then you might come over here and take a drink. And um, 
Okay, so here's some literature. This is WHO funded and some really good stuff from New Zealand. Um, there was the Moore crew that did the, where's, where's my Kiwi guys? At the back there, oh, there you go. You, you, do you know them? Do you know Moore who did this study on the, the um, separation distances for um, viral contamination of groundwater wells? Oh, oh, you go check it out, it's great. So, um, uh, so the study was done largely in, based in New Zealand, um, and they were using um, uh, viruses, are, as we've started to hear, much more contagious at very low um, levels. So in order to get sick from eating poo and, let's say, E. coli, you need to consume about 100,000 um, coliform-forming units of E. coli, uh, which may sound like a lot. It's probably just like a tiny you know, fingernail full of poo. But in order to get infected by um, a norovirus or hepatitis, you need to eat one plaque-forming unit of a virus. Uh, and those things are very small, much smaller than fecal coliforms, which can get filtered out. They survive at cold temperatures, and they travel very long distances. So even, the, we're, let's, let's pretend that all of our pit toilets are the Washington regulation, and the bottom of the pit toilet is three feet or a meter above seasonal high groundwater. Really good situation and rare. Let's imagine that to be the case with a, with a sandy loam soil for the meter below the pit toilet and then a gravelly till underneath. Viruses can travel three kilometers. Um, that's, in the, that's a very good separation distance of a pit toilet to the groundwater, at least in BC, Washington, West Coast. Um, three kilometers away. How many places in campgrounds where you have a water source are three kilometers away from your pit toilet? That many. Because who's going to walk three kilometers to get their water, or three kilometers to poo in the toilet? <laughs> They're not. They're just going to go poo around the corner. Um, okay, so this is, and, and the, about the same thing was by this other G British Geological Survey, more based on um, some research in Africa, guidelines for assessing the risk of groundwater from on-site sanitation. Pit toilets are not a reliable uh, means of, of um, managing human waste, basically, is what I'm getting to here. So they're not effective. There's no treatment paradigm. There's nothing happening there. They're dumps. Conceptually, they're dumps in our, in our park. And they're entirely unsafe with respect to virus transport through the soil to the water source. There is a, a director's order, which is that second classification that um, in the National Parks USA and I believe Forest Service, too, that doesn't encourage the replacement of a pit toilet with a pit toilet. Um, have you heard that, John? Yeah. But what are you going to replace it with? These are pit toilets that are in the boondocks. Are you going to put in a composting toilet? OK, composting toilets. Here we go. Uh, we, uh, again, we don't compost our shit at home. Why are we trying to do it at these high use, no power, no water sites? This is BC Parks. Um, uh, Liard Hot Springs. I'm, I'm going to use their name because I got, I got, I'm a bit choked that I didn't get this RFP. I didn't win it to fix it. Um, and so y this is funny. 100,000 people a year go to the site. Beautiful site. And you have to, you, there's a boardwalk you walk across for about 200 meters um, because there's a, a, an endemic fish that lives in the very hot water runoff from the hot pools. Tiny little thing. And it's there's snow all around, but right in this spot, it always there's no snow accumulation, so it's it's year round. And um, this this is comp there's a couple composting toilet things here, and this is what it looks like. And once a year, when the, when the visitation drops off, this public park this operator is a concessionaire operator for the park. He drives a golf cart with a trailer um, along the boardwalk. There's just enough space for him to do U-turn by the building, um, and he goes in with shovels and pails and shovels this sloppy shit into pails, puts the pails on the golf cart, he can fit about four pails in the golf cart, drives the 200 yards, um, and dumps it in another tank, ready for the septic truck, to, tr septic truck to come and suck that tank out. Turns around, drives back. It takes him a month to empty all of the waste out of these three large tanks, because he can only do it in the morning and at night when there's nobody there because it smells so bad. Um, a couple times, the golf cart and trailer have spilled into this endemic stream, shit into the stream, again. Lovely. Um, we've tried these dozens of, maybe hundreds of times to failure every time. 
So we're going to go on a quick little photo tour here of all the composting toilets I've stuck my head into. Um, this gets very graphic. You might want to squint or something. Um, yeah, yeah, composting. Is, there's no mass reduction. Um, there's 300% more mass. Here's Rich, crouched down. I can't even get a good photograph, really. This is all this weird, junky stuff that someone tried to put in to fix it. Um, I tried that, too, for a little while. Valley, everyone's made valiant efforts to try and make these things work. Um, this, is what, this is a hotter climbing area. Um, electrical conductivity through the roof from urine. Here's a, this is a little Yoho Valley up in National Park, a Yoho National Park. Um, the double decker, this is, uh, um, I don't know how old, four, six years old. You know, it's just a big poo molecule, blobule. Um, this is the urine and black water all leaches down the middle of the thing, so that's where people pee. That's what they have to try and empty. Um, so this one is, uh, this is up on Mount Shasta. This one actually, of all of them, might be working better. This guy is so dedicated. He's a volunteer. He said he would never get paid to do this work because they couldn't pay him enough. Um, but it, it might be working more than, I mean, look how much snow there is. It's incredible. Uh, this is my field assistant. He hated me at the end of the year. Um, yeah, compost. Yeah, right, compost, uh-huh. Breaking down wood chips. You know, um, Romtech. This is up in the uh, Nahani National Park, way in northern Canada. <laughs> they had these Romtechs that didn't work. So when John and I were talking about the definition of insanity, oh, this didn't work. Let's buy a bigger one. Um, Never installed it. They, yeah. This is that. This is uh, BC Park. Some Laird Hot Springs. This is an interesting site. BC BC Park site. They were still under the mentality that they could dump it on site um, and call it good. Um, I found Diploscapter and Rebdidus hookworms um, alive and free living in this pile of material dumped outside the park, outside the toilet. Um, bears, ravens. There's all sorts of things that. Uh, marmots, as we know, that consume human waste. So now we've just exposed um, this stuff. It's better in a hole. It's actually probably better to put the shit in a hole and put a cover on it than, than dig it up again and spread it around the site. Because now we've probably infected the local population of mammals with, with a human hookworm. Um, that They're going to go and poop all over the place and maybe in the lake. Um, I, I did some other you know, intense studies on hookworm degradation here to see if they would ever get up to the temperature necessary to kill hookworms. I won't bore you with it. Um, this is a newer version of some of these composting toilets. It's underground. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Um, this is me growing tomatoes purely on urine and rainwater from a different perspective. Um, we'll, we'll get to that in a sec. <coughs> Composting toilets, a misnomer, was one of my publications. Uh, so Wait, I wrote a. Did you eat tomatoes? Huh? What? Did you eat tomatoes? <laughs> of course I did. <laughs> there, there is no, there is no biological chemical pathway <laughs> to take, to take. Let's say, let's say I was peeing uh, hepatitis. Okay? okay. Somehow I'm peeing hepatitis. I don't think it's possible. Um, <laughs> hepatitis doesn't, like this virus doesn't crawl up the vine and go over into the tomato and like jump into the tomato. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I stuck my head in all of the brands of public scale composting toilets, which I, um, I don't say their names because one of them th uh, threatened to sue me um, for doing research on composting toilets. That was a good sign. I was like, ding, ding, I'm onto something. Um, <laughs> So there are 12 sites, 16 chambers, 100 plus samples. There's an NSF standard 41, which uh, suggests uh, which composting toilets are designed properly. Um, none of the chambers pass that NSF standard 41. None of the chambers or processes pass an EPA 503 regulations. Um, nothing in the literature body has ever indicated a composting toilet has ever, even in like Africa where it's hot, has heated up more than 10 degrees above ambient temperatures. So no, no, nowhere in the world is it ambient plus 10 equals 55 Celsius. It's impossible. Zero out of 100 samples met the definition that's well established in the literature body for compost. Forget the fact that it didn't go through the process or that it didn't meet um, any of the others. Stability, maturity, and um, uh, smell are the three best ways where you can say, is this material compost? 
If it's not stable, it's still active and sending off CO2 because things are still eating the available carbon. Maturity is about the nutrients. If all of the nitrogen is in ammonia and it stinks, it's not stabilized and moved the nitrogen into nitrates, which are used by plants, all plants. And if it smells bad, it's shit. And, and all of the samples were so foul that um, I had to do a lot of this work in my garage. And the lab and the university wouldn't have my samples any, anywhere. Uh, the raw fecal matter that I took samples from and sent to the lab, my lab fees just climbed and climbed and climbed year after year after year because they hated working with it. Um, raw fecal matter was no different from compost, toilet, end product. There was no significant difference between those two from E. coli, volatile solids, and stability. Um, all of them are continuous flow, designed continuous flow, and from an engineering perspective, given that we're peeing into them largely, uh, it takes um, maybe a couple hours to a day for the urine to infiltrate through the six-year-old mass, perhaps, of some of the very low-use sites to get to the bottom of the chamber. And if you happen to have someone pee into it, the day before you come in and shovel out the bottom, you're really shoveling, in, in actuality, an effective residence time of material that's one to two days old. Um, so, and then you're going to go and spread that around your site when it could have pathogens that exited someone's body days ago. So there's actually two outcomes of these composting toilets. One, one in two, two real camps. This is really what composting toilets are doing out there, if anyone is curious to know. Um, one is an ammonification toilet, where it's used heavily for urine. This would be your uh, trailhead and campground. Um, and the, the, most of the chemical dominance of that type of toilet is from urea. Urea is the main component of our urine. And urea hydrolyzes very rapidly um, to ammonia and ammonium, which are in equilibrium with each other um, in any state, any aquarium or wastewater treatment plant. Ammonia and ammonium are in balance. And there is a, an escalating curve when you urinate more and more into poopy wood chips to generate ammonia. And the ammonia smells bad, and we use ammonia as a cleaner because it, we use it to clean our kitchen and kill bacteria in the kitchen. So this is the generating and accelerating, and we end up with uh, this like uh, um, small process to generate ammonia and inhibit entirely the decomposition of the mass that's inside there. Smells terrible, you pull out six-year-old poop that's um, ammonified. It's like mummified, but it's very wet, and um, if you take the ammonia away by letting it off-gas for days, then it's ready to go, and it's all ready to break down and decompose. And, um, so, yeah, those were great. They weren't that, the, it, the ammonia effect wasn't strong enough to kill the pathogens. Um, so they killed everything else, the weaker, you know, um, uh, heterotrophic bacteria that were supposed to do the composting, the moldering. Those were all, they, those didn't live. And then there was the pathogen brew pot, I called it. And these were primarily fecal matter. Um, if you really had to go, you're like hiking down the trail, you peed a little while ago at the toilet, and you know that the toilet's coming up, and you, you're just going to make it to the toilet. And, and so people trail side, or, or sorry, in the middle of the trail, like on trail toilets are used a lot for pooping. Um, you're at a climbing area, you're gonna go pee behind a rock, but if you gotta poop, you're gonna go hike to 10 minutes to the toilet. And those were, um, one in particular was UBC CK Choice Toilet, and um, which, which used to be the flagship for these composting toilets until this bit of research came out. And they had um, over 100,000 counts of E. coli in material that was five years old. It was just brewing. It was the perfect temperature, 30, 35 degrees Celsius, which is about the same temperature as the inside of our intestine. Um, and we're adding to it, inoculating it every day with fecal pathogens, much more than are naturally coming through with a little bit of largely sterile wood shavings we're putting into it. So those brewed pathogens. Okay. How effective were these? How if it, like we evaluated pit toilets for did they accomplish the objectives of what we were trying to do? It, very expensive to maintain, very hazardous to maintain, increase the end mass about 300% because we're adding wood chips to it. Um, the wood chips soak up a lot of the urine, the rest of the urine drains off. Um, ineffective, 
largely ineffective. The only thing I thought they were effective at was providing a, a means of collecting the human waste, but better off than just to collect it in a container, like one of those Romtex, not put the bulking agent in, and, and fly it out. Um, but when you get it in a small little hatch in a box, and you've got to shovel it and get it in and out of a door or a hatch, then it's just a real big pain in the ass then. Why not just, I think those fly out Romtex or fly out barrels make a lot more sense. Um, okay, vault toilets. Uh, th these are vaults really, it, they come from a true waste management perspective. The Canadian Alpine Club uses these extensively because you, you get it in a barrel, you get it out. Just like a clean mountain can. You get it in there, you get it out. This, we're not, the, the, these hut groups or national parks, um, they're not, we're not trained to be waste management. You know, you know we don't have the knowledge or the equipment, uh, the infrastructure to manage, th to treat the waste. So let's just get it out. Get it to one of those facilities that do. As it happens, it's expensive because helicopters are expensive and it's a long way. So it ends up being expensive. But at least you're maintaining the environment to its cleanest point um, and uh, you're not, um, you, you know, you're not trying to do something unrealistic. You're just getting it out. So in the Canadian Alpine Club, they rely on um, hut users to move the barrels. And I, I don't entirely agree with that approach um, because I've moved a 200 kilogram barrel of pissy shit. And it's the scariest, one of the scariest things I've done in my life. Um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you get, it takes a lot of momentum to move a 200 kilogram thing of anything. And so you put your hip into it and now the barrel's about here. Right? And, and you've got to get it going, so you've got to hit it a little bit. And then and it's sloshy, and you maybe you put the lid on, but it's, you know, it's terrible. The Alpine Club seems to make it work, and people don't complain that much. It's bad. It's terrible. Come on. I think it's terrible. It, yet, it, it works. So the Alpine Club has made it work, and the users of, of the Canadian Alpine Club system have bought into it, and it's reliable. So, um, but I still don't think it's a long-term solution or something that I would recommend other parks get into. Have our, our, the public, and this wouldn't fly in the States because there's more like litigation concern, I think. But um, anyway, human waste production and composition. Let's look at this differently. Let's abandon nutrient recovery in, in the remote places. Let's entirely abandon that, just for a sec and go back to, if we were starting fresh and we had this problem of human waste in the backcountry, how are we going to manage it? We would look at what is human waste? Urine, fecal matter. Urine, per use, I measured this by collecting it in barrels and moving them. Um, 160 to 200 milliliters per use, Coke can, I think, Coke can, about. 80% uh, plant nutrients. Um, of human waste, 80% are in urine. Zero heavy metals, zero pathogens. Uh, unless you have a bladder infection, but that's not a real pathogen. It's not like your bladder infection is going to give someone else a bladder infection. Um, it's it's self-sanitizing if you store it, uh, and that's because of, of ammonia. Ammonia will escalate naturally in stored urine and kill everything, um, and that's why Roger added urea after he had stabilized um, his <coughs> vermicomposted human waste, because it's a very effective end-of-the-pipe sanitization pathway. Um, and uh, fecal matter is le about half that, so 80 to 100 grams per use, 20% of the plant nutrients, 100% of the heavy metals, and 100% of the pathogens. We're talking 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 8. So I don't know if this is 100,000 or a million or 10 million or something. And then you have the helminth um, ova there. The viruses come out of there and the protozoan cysts, the uh, Giardia, Cryptosporidium stuff. Um, it doesn't flow by gravity, it's sticky, as we know from the conveyor belt from the other description. So if you're looking at this, and, and there's this weird mentality of let's use, let's, use, <laughs> let's use our shit for agriculture. You know, let's reuse, let's, let's take our shit and put it back in the garden. We don't need organic matter in North America, really. We, don't, we have a lot of organic matter throughout most of North America, most of the world. Um, what we need are nutrients. We need nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium to grow. And we need sustainable forms of uh, uh, phosphorus as well. So if you were looking at this, you would say, well, let's take the urine and do something useful with it. And let's put the shit in a corner and try and hope it goes away and not add anything to it and not touch it. I, that's, how, that's the program that I would set up. So what that looks like, I think I used up all the batteries in this thing. I was pressing the red button a lot. 
Um, and just go for it. Thanks. Okay, so, so fundamentals of, of waste management. Stepping back again, applying fundamentals here. Source separation. Um, we used to uh, put it all into one bin and send it to landfill. We realized, oh, that doesn't make a lot of sense. You fill up the landfill quick and it makes methane and all these other things. So let's separate it so that we retain the value in the different um, types of feedstock materials that are going in there. And this is pretty well established. So let's apply this simply. We only have two waste streams, urine and fecal matter. And as you saw, I, I, there aren't too many like um, good clip art you can take on source separated human waste, you know. But that, that was the, the, the weightlifting guy. You go in the pooping position or the, you know, most women's peeing position, I guess. Some guys sit down to pee, as it turns out. Um, and physiologically, we have source separation going on. Um, and in the history of mammals on Earth, every mammal has source separation going on, however you come to play it. You poop, and a lot of these mammals will do like other things to cover up the poop, and they'll often still be peeing. Well, I, I look at these things because I study it so much, you know? Um, so we don't even have to do much. Okay, let's go to the next one. Um, so I started thinking, oh, wow, with most of it's urine, and the urine is sterile, and there's plant nutrients, and it flows by gravity. Let's get the urine into the soil. Soil microbes and plant um, are all striving for nitrogen primarily, phosphorus next, potassium third. Those are the limiting factors in life, NPK. Urine has it all. Uh, one, go back a sec. There was a question, can we add urine diversion to a romtech ish This would be your best shot, um, but if you could lift the lid up here, you would see that there's a small drain hole. It's about an inch, it's about that big. It clogged up in all of the retrofits I did in days. Clogged up with, you name it. It's not that hard to name things. Um, and so uh, perhaps it would be effective if you could control that user group closely. They were in your house, your lodge, or something, and you told them, don't do anything nasty in the front cup of that weird looking toilet. Don't poop in it, don't drop gum in it, don't spit a loogie in it, don't put your cigarette in it. Good luck. Next. Okay, so this is the next one. So I went to, got invited to France by Pierre and um, got a great week skiing up into these mountains and um, doing a bunch of research with them. Uh, so Ecosphere Technologies, now Sandy Sphere, right? Um, and Eco Demio, there's a little bit of interesting um, history between those two. Uh, manufacture a mechanical urine diversion system. We saw the goods of it from the last presentation. No bulking agent. So the first step here, urine diversion way into soil. As someone else said, um, uh, it, was, it was Joe Arnold said if we took the urine away from his dehydrating toilets, we'd have 50% less material to manage. Instantly, our waste management costs in North American remote sites would go in half or more. So enormous cost savings here if you think about it. And two, no more bulking agent. Some parks don't use the bulking agent anymore, but they're not following their instruction manuals. You should be putting bulking agent in so it's not terrible to shovel out. Um, and if you don't add the bulking agent, there's another like 30%. So we're down already at you know, less than a third of the waste mass that we started with. Um, generally, the urine goes to a gravity drain field or a sewer if it's close by. I did an installation of one of these recently. There's a big water main, a city water main going right by and there was concerns. Even if we built a septic line and the, the water main should be sealed, but there was a sewer that was quite close. And it's very easy to run two or four inch pipe a long way and have the urine go into the sewer. It's much more expensive to bring water up there and now you're flushing a ton more down and everything. So urine can go to a, a drain or a sewer and there's not much of it. You know, the, I sold another toilet recently up to Glacier Bay National Park and they developed um, the septic field for it. When it finally made it through up uh, in the administration, they said, you need two square feet of, of septic soil for the amount of urine you're gonna deal with. And they said it's not even worth it, so multiply it by 10. Okay, well let's put in 20 square feet of septic soil, which you know, is a, it was a very small amount of septic soil. 
when, there's very little amount of urine compared to the domestic or industrial um, wastewater that comes out of showers, washing machines, fl flushing toilets. Okay. So here's a summary. Uh, urine diverting vermin composting toilet. Um, end product was stable to very stable using a variety of indices. Um, someone's interested, we can chat later. There was no odor. I believe there was a study was done by Ecosphere and it, was, it smelled inside the technical chamber, face to face with the poop um, of cauliflower or, or like old cauliflower or something. I worked inside both and there really isn't a smell. The smell comes from urine. Fecal matter off gases quite quickly and I managed my own human waste in my garage for a little while while I was doing my PhD. And after the first hour or two, the smell of fecal matter it off gases and dissipates and becomes aerobic and doesn't smell, especially when the worms and the bacteria that colonize around the worm infiltrate. And that's what Roger was seeing too. I mean, quite rapidly, the smell dissipates. Um, a highly effective sanitization pathway for bacteria. Lots of trash, waste management costs. I think the true cost is obviously less. Ecosphere, Sanisphere needs to make money when they're offering it for 500 euros or however much they offer it now. Um, dry matter reduction was 40%, which is on par with industrial composting. Um, emptied every 10 to 20 years. So here, just to summarize in comparison, the cost of the composting toilet were 10 times more, exposure events were 10 times more, dry matter reduction was almost 10 times. There was positive increases in dry matter with the composting toilet because of the bulking agent. Disposal was every six months or two years with the composting toilet, emptied every 10 to 20 years in French systems. So, um, and then the pathogen destruction was the biggest factor of difference there. Okay, next. So the implications here, so we try to make this as simple as possible. So step one, really I think most situations, unless you're in a, such a sensitive site that you, that you have to take the urine out, divert the urine, urine into the soil. Some sites where it doesn't apply, there's some Maori sites in New Zealand where nothing can go into the site, no urine. So, right? No human waste. So it doesn't work there. But those are rare. Most places can handle urine, the very small amounts of urine. And even, even glacial till, there's microbes that are living in there. And even if you needed to entirely encase a urine treatment system, you could run a EPDM liner, you know, with some sand on the top of it for 10 or 20 feet. And urine would come in one side and nothing would come out the other side for a long, long time. Because there's so much demand for those nutrients in the environment, you essentially would be building a very small, simple wetland system by just making a liner and having the urine go into it. Sooner or later, and you should see photos in the bugaboos, where the urine is discharged, the grass is like six feet tall. And beside it, there's moss. And here, there's like, you know, it's a fertilizer. Okay, step two, don't add any bulking agent. Step three, look and see what's eating manure from other mammals in your area. Um, most cases, uh, you know, worms do a great job, and worm, you'll find worms, but uh, as was discussed earlier, there's pill bugs, there's the sow bugs. Um, I tried some other things, I think that'll be the next slide. Um, but hold on, so uh, yeah, um, put those in. So take the fecal matter that's been developing, find what's eating fecal matter in your region. Add it to the, your human fecal matter. And toilet paper is simple, it's cellulose. All sorts of things will eat toilet paper. It's much easier for a bug to eat toilet paper than it is for it to chew away at a cedar tree. You know, cedar is like highly <laughs> resistant to decay. It's gonna be like, oh my God, toilet paper, I love it. And stay there and have all its babies there. Then go out back into the cedar tree. Okay, don't touch the poo, leave it for as long as you can. Step five, budget a line item um, and put it on the next guy who's gonna come into your spot to every decade remove the material that you've left in the corner and not touched for as long as possible. Um, and they will look at that and say, you, really, that's it? Okay, next. So I tried slugs in the Pacific Northwest because of the, this real concern, a legitimate and real concern to not introduce um, Isnia fetida, which is a red worm, and vermicomposting worm into national parks. There's all sorts of other things, as we know, that'll consume manure. Every mammal in your park produces manure and it gets consumed. When you go walking down the trail, you don't see build up and build up of you know, goat poop, poop droplets or rabbit poop droplets. It's getting consumed by things. Figure out what it is, drop it in there. 
Um, however, in reality, most of your parks probably have Yisnia fetida in it, which is the red worm, the wriggling worm, because people use those for fishing. They follow horse pack trains around. So if you have horses or if you have fishing in your parks, you probably got Yisnia fetida. So the way around that is just to grab some local manure in your already established park stable, grab some of the horse manure that's well decayed and aging, and add it to your fecal matter. Um, and that's why I think it's preferred in the future to call these urine diverting waterless toilets. You want to stick something on at the end, it would be invertebrate decomposition. But ultimately, urine diverting, first step, main reduction in mass. Two, um, you know, waterless, uh, you know, uh, no bulking agent. So urine diverting waterless invertebrate decomposition. Okay, next. Um, so, in reality, the hardest step in all of that, I was saying it like it was easy, the, the hardest step is diverting the urine. Behaviorally, one option, um, try and convince yourself next time you take a dump to not pee. As some people can do it, some people really can't. They kind of come out at the same time. <laughs> um, it's something that's not talked about a lot. It's fun to like talk about these things. Um, Okay, so the other, you could get an EcoVita seat, like I showed you before, maybe if you have control over your user group and can tell them to not put anything in that weird little cup in the front. And then mechanical seems to me to be the most reliable solution in this situation. Um, now, um, there's two options for conveyor belt, mechanical, um, EcoSphere, SaniSphere, and um, there is a, Sandysphere provides the mechanism and the toilet structure, from my understanding of um, communications with them, not recently, but previously with Pierre. And um, I didn't think that was cost effective in order to integrate that technology in the North American market um, because we can build buildings in North America. And it doesn't make a lot of sense for me in that frame of mind, thinking how do I leverage my uh, understanding of this topic and turn it into a profitable money-making venture like we all need to do to support things we want to do in family and whatnot. So uh, it didn't make sense to, b to ship a building across the ocean. So instead, there's another manufacturer of this that manufactures um, conveyor belts in France. And um, he has a patent also on the system. Um, I'm sure there will be some interesting debates between um, the two original patent holders. but. Um, so that's Ecosphere Technologies, and um, I buy and sell his equipment uh, for North America. And that's, uh, I call it behind the wall, because it's a system that can sit on the flat ground. It doesn't need a basement, so much of a basement. And it works through the wall, behind the wall. The conveyor belt goes right on the flat, and it goes up and through the wall. It's operated by a foot pedal, pedal power. Um, similar, it's very similar. Eco, uh, the owner of Eco, uh, sorry, of um, Eco de Mio, who manufactures <laughs> this one, used to work for Pierre Colombo, and they established some agreement um, to, to separate the manufacturing of these units. Um, so the other system that I manufacture myself it came from a lot of conversations with park operators, Forest Service, and National Park, that they didn't think people would be reliable to operate the foot pedal. Um, and that material would accumulate. Um, it works in Europe, absolutely works in Europe, but people have been trained. And it's, there's a consensus that North, Amer North Americans are lazy in the bathroom. So, <laughs> uh, so I, I linked up the door to mechanical power from, for the system that I des designed and developed and have sold to separate the urine. It's off a big plate. Imagine a big windshield wiper underneath your toilet hole and there's a sweeper bar that comes and sweeps your poop and toilet paper off to the side. Every time you open and close the door, which does the same action, the sweeper sweeps your poop off to the side, and the plate is inclined so that urine gets collected um, off it. Uh, and that's called the below the floor system. Okay, next. Uh, here's a, this is a, a toilet that was designed um, in combination with the Glacier Bay National Park Service. It's using panabode. There's bear issues up there, so it's very thick. Five lamb, cedar, panabode. <clears throat> and the concept of, you know, you open and close the door, and the urine comes off the front, and fecal matter goes off the side. Um, so I don't have so much uh, building products, whatever. There's so many parks have so many different desires in Forest Service to build the building like this or like that, or, you know, we have a lot of money, we don't have any money at all. So instead, I'm just working on 
providing the technical components of urine diversion and, and linking them up to specific components of building design to get the job done. Next. This is an example. This is in Squamish um, using uh, the conveyor belt from EcoDemio. And um, it, it's, a, it's a nonprofit project. It was sponsored by Mountain Equipment Co-op um, and the District of Squamish and the Climate Action Network um, to put that toilet, toilet in there. Two different seat options. So he has a, he has a mechanical patent on, on his system and also a design um, patent on this like pretty aesthetically pleasing um, uh, riser. So that's it. Questions? So it would, you know, put it through a pipe, a big pipe, with a bunch of packed media, um, a variety of packed media. So, you know, some organic matter, some peat, and some sand, and maybe some volcanic rock. Um, so you'd be looking here to um, do some adsorption um, and also some denitrification, some nitrification, denitrification. Um, and there's good literature, EPA literature, that shows you can do this on a pretty rapid time scale, a small volume too. So you're actually you're oxidizing the nitrogen to its final step where it goes off as NO2 gas. Um, and evaporating, you know, you'd probably be evaporating. So maybe the first step would be that pipe. And then if there was some leftover, maybe you'd just open it up into a, it'd be in the ground, but maybe a trough, like a lined trough in the ground, so above ground septic field almost. We would never think of putting in an above ground septic field because it would flood with, fl with water when we're flushing. But there's so little. It'll, To feed the, to feed the baits, or, or the, just the, to bioactivate, to bioactivate, it, is it necessary to feed something for the nutrients for the eater, as it were? <laughs> um, well, the worms are self-sustaining, so you add them once to get it going and make sure that you know that community uh, dominates. So if you just left it to its own accord, I think you would end up with a very different system in every place. But if you seed it with something specific, um, you establish a, a relatively stable community state. Um, and you can do this in a variety of ecosystems. If you go up into the Arctic, you can plant you know, domestic plants, and they'll colonize, and they'll keep out the native uh, satsafragia and blueberry from growing there in that little spot. Um, so you, you need to seed it once. But the worms may die over the winter if it's cold enough, but the cocoons have quite a resistant physiology to come back alive next year. Um, the, the, the operation and maintenance. Um, you know, the, the folks behind you from Sanisphere would be better to describe that, but as they said, it, what they find, and they manage a lot of their own service on the toilets they sell, is that it, once a year for 10 minutes, which I think is probably more like an hour, you need to go through your system and probably clean some things out and scrape some things off and shovel some material around. There's no entirely maintenance-free system out there. Um, but it's, it's much, much lower than what's involved in North American composting toilets. My system is relatively new. I, I've gone through a few generations of design with a few different clients, some portable, some retrofit, and now this um, toilet with Glacier Bay is my first full 
design, build, operate, if you will. And um, the, a report just came back from the park operator that everything looked like it should. So it's probably been used a couple hundred, maybe a thousand times by now. It's the busy season. It's been installed for a month. Um, I went back to my portable system that's been on a trailer. It had 2,500 uses. Um, the plate was clean, and um, some material had built up around the edges of the plate. The next design, I cut the edges off. So there no more edge. Um, it'll be an iterative process like all new technology that comes out, but it's very simple. There's very few moving parts. A pulley, two cables, and a sweeper bar. There's a brass bushing. There's very few parts to, to worry about. So we get to the finer scale of back to that, we're going to make a 10% improvement here, a 10% improvement there. There'll be a little bit more cost next time. If someone wants something fancy, they can put it in. But ultimately, you know, we're talking about two pretty distinct concepts and, and required maintenance packages. Jeff? I want to thank Jeff. Thank you.